No, I agree. I agree. I um, I don't drive. Uh, I'm enough like of an asshole anymore, so I can um. Yeah. I would. I would probably opt into that if it was going to save me a few bucks. All right, and just like that, we are back again with the Mind the Growth podcast. As always, I am Chris Kinghorn, and I'm Eric Hoffman. Today, we are going to get to the soul of the Web three problem. <laughs> Do you know what I mean by that? Are you talking about was it Call of Duty or was it World of Warcraft <laughs> or Warcraft. was it World of yeah, Warcraft? A game I've never played, but I've heard about. So in the news, our our good friend Vitalik Buterin, the co-founder of Ethereum, he released a paper with a few co-authors that is talking about this concept called soul bound NFTs, SBT for short. And uh, I found it very interesting. A lot of people are either hating on it or glorifying it, which is you know how everything goes in the internet age. But I think it's really interesting and I think there's lots of use cases around it uh, that they don't even necessarily touch on in the in the paper. But I thought what we could maybe do to start us off is I'm going to share the actual paper itself and we'll we'll post it in the show notes and then I'll read the abstract just to kind of kick us off. So can you can you see it? Yep. All right, cool. So the abstract, it states Web3 today centers around expressing transferable financialized assets rather than encoding social relationships of trust. Yet many core economic activities, such as uncollateralized lending and building personal brands, are built on persistent, non-transferable relationships. In this paper, we illustrate how non-transferable soul-bound tokens, SBTs for short, representing the commitments, credentials, and affiliations of souls or human beings, can encode the trust networks of the real economy to establish provenance and reputation. More importantly, SBTs enable other applications of increasing ambition, such as community wallet recovery, Sybil resistance governance, which resistant governance, which I have no idea what that means, mechanisms for decentralization and novel market and decomposable shared rights. We call this richer pluralistic ecosystem decentralized society or DSOC for short, uh, co-determined social sociality where souls and communities come together button, bottom up as emergent properties of each other to co-create plural network goods and intelligences at a range of scales. Key to this soci sociality is a decomposable property rights and enhanced governance mechanisms such as quadratic funding discontinued, discounted by correlation scores that reward trust and cooperation while protecting networks from capture, extraction, and domination. With such augmented sociality, Web3 can askew today's hyper-financialization in favor of a more transformative, pluralistic future of increasing returns across social distance. A and mouthful. if you are still with us, and if you haven't <laughs> turned off the video, you better like, subscribe, uh, and comment. <laughs> Thank you for, for sitting through that. <laughs> I, I haven't done a public reading since the 12th grade. That was a bit rough. So that, sorry. That for was everyone. like popcorn, <laughs> popcorn reading. You, you exactly. got called on. Yeah. Terrified to, to present. <clears throat> so, okay. And uh, in a very dumbed down version, um, what does that mean? <laughs> Good question. Um, I'm not sure if I've fully uh, fully understood it, but what I think it could mean is there are things we still do in society today that are seemingly outdated in a digital world, like, for instance, giving a physical driver's license or a passport or a college degree or a you know proof of attendance to a concert or a uh, you know, in a conference that you go to, something to that effect. These types of things really are very late to the digitization of everything. And with the, you know, technologies of blockchain and Web3 that are revolutionizing financialization of 
you know, tokens and, and money and currency, things of that nature. There's other use cases like this that you can account for on a public ledger and potentially even a private ledger to basically have what most people know as NFTs, uh, a picture of a, an ape, as your own credentials that are non-transferable, non-revocable, things of that nature. So what I think is, is a really interesting prospect is all of these things that I mentioned, having the ability to you know show up in your personal wallet that you can show proof of, you can go to the airport, scan, you know, whether it's a key or, or something, I, I, I don't know what it'll be, but, you know, show proof of who you are, what you have, et cetera, to make everything more efficient and to avoid all of these ridiculous delays and, and, you know, losing, losing an ID and having to go to the, the motor vehicle division down the road and waiting two hours just to get a new one that, I mean, that is insane in today's world. So those are some of the use cases that I foresee and potentially even something like digitizing health records that are uh, transferable to different EHR systems. So you actually own your health records versus, you know, a, a medical doctor owning them and having to sign off to send them somewhere else. Those types of things. Obviously, there's certain needs for uh, privacy. <laughs> I don't know how that works in a public ledger, but... Someone like Vitalik is probably the good person to figure that out. <laughs> I absolutely agree. And and when I think about it, it's really just in the most elementary level. It's it's a you wallet. It's everything that is you mm -hmm. on the blockchain. Again, the private component is going to be huge. And I mean, how do you think this could reland insurance? Obviously, you're a big insurance guy. So yeah, if you could keep track of not even just on the on the medical side or you know your car car insurance, your house, yeah, your, yeah. you know, homeowners insurance, there could be for the insurance industry could be huge. And then honestly, maybe building credit, making sure that you're, you have an appropriate credit score. Uh, the, the risk for identity theft could potentially go down if everything is secure. There, there's a lot of different yeah. use cases that kind of, as I'm thinking through this, that really pop up. Yeah. Great question. So what what actually fascinated me about Bitcoin early on when I first read about it in like 2012 or what, whenever it was, the the potential of smart contracts, which is what Ethereum really revolutionized. So with insurance and other legal contracts, there should be a way, and I know people are developing it, not me, unfortunately, I'd love to, but uh, there should be a way to put these types of contracts, like an insurance contract, onto a blockchain and have it be more of an automated system where there's no there's no brokers, there's no agents, there's no middlemen, there's an insurance company or per perhaps even a decentralized fund that acts like an insurance company. And there's a contract that if a claim is triggered of some sort, there should be a verifiable way to know that that fits into a coverage category and then an automatic payout into your wallet for whatever you know amount you know, the coverage uh, accounts for. So to give an example of, let's say, a car insurance policy. So if you if you get into an accident and this is recorded into whether it's, you know, a police report or, you know, a repair worker's ledger, what I, I don't know how this will all work, but there should be a verifiable way to know that there was an accident and you have $100,000 of coverage to fix your car. So based on that accident, based on how it happened, based on what's what part of the car is damaged, then that smart contract should trigger immediately. There shouldn't need to be any discussion unless maybe it's a complex situation where a human might need to be involved, but it should trigger that claim, pay out what it's supposed to pay out, go right into your wallet or somebody else's wallet that's repairing it and the the situation's over. And that assumingly would prevent further fraud or, um, you know, reduce costs tremendously and make the entire system way more efficient. Same is true for like a legal contract. Uh, you know, attorneys <laughs> shouldn't really be necessary with smart contracts because you don't need to arbitrate on an agreement that's 
digital and provable. It is what it is. It either happened or it didn't. Right. Well, and then just for everybody, um, I'd have to imagine that most of the audience is understanding what a smart contract. But for those of you who might be new that maybe don't follow the uh, the crypto sphere as much as we do um, and why we think this is such a great use case is a smart contract is really just an if then statement. So it's really black or white. If, if this happens, then there's if an input happens, there's an output. Depending on what the input is, there's a specific output. So Eric yeah. says, I will sell you this this box for five dollars. If I give him five dollars through the blockchain, it's then going to give me the rights to that box. So, all these these use cases for you know determining who is the, in the right and the wrong of the accident, you know that's a pretty straightforward. Of it would either one side's fault or the other side's fault. Uh, same thing with uh, really ultimately anything, not anything, but a lot of the things that attorneys look like as well too. So, uh, <laughs> we'll have to check in with our attorney friends to see if they're getting nervous <laughs> of everything that's going on with smart contracts. I doubt it. I mean the the. One thing that I can't seem to conceptualize or get my head around that I don't know how it would be digitized or uh, created into a smart contract, there's all these subjective rules and subjective opinions on how certain things happen. And that's really where attorneys and laws came into being in the first place is to dissect the rules and make a judgment on them. So I think for most things, it this should be an obvious step towards the future is a smart contract because most things are binary and most things you can program in that way there's a subsection of those types of things that you, you might need an attorney you might need a judge you might need a jury i don't know but much less than we do today and that's that's the whole hope cuz part as it, somebody who works in insurance there's a large portion of a premium that you're paying that is specific to all of the middlemen involved in the transaction, the broker, the agent, the insurance carrier, uh, a general agent. There's so many hands that go into a bucket of an insurance policy today that is just ridiculous and irrelevant and so inefficient that this is like a no brainer to me. I, I, I think this is definitely the future, at least in insurance. Didn't didn't uh, Elon Musk come up with his? Don't they have? Doesn't Tesla have its own insurance company that basically cut out all those pieces that you yeah, just mentioned? Yeah, which is perfect and the most genius use case for Tesla. Um, I don't know how how big it is or if it's even like out of beta yet, but. Yeah, I mean, they have all of the driver's data already <laughs> in their systems. They know exactly how these people are driving. You don't need to add a chip, which most people like me don't want to do. It's already in the car. They know exactly what you're doing, how you're driving, your risk profile. The underwriting is incredibly easy. And therefore, the premiums would be incredibly low because they know everything about you. So, yeah. I, it, it's the perfect use case is to have a car company who has an electric car, all of the data issue an insurance policy. So follow on question, would you, if you had a Tesla, would you elect to participate in their insurance program, even if it was significantly, actually for you, the way you drive, it might not be that much cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it depends on how they'd underwrite me. Uh, I mean, so there's one part where I probably wouldn't buy a Tesla because I just don't think it's a great car. Um, my my mom had a Tesla Model X. It was okay. Is it worth you know the hundred to one hundred and fifty grand for top top of the line SUV? I don't think so at all. the The materials just aren't there yet. It's not put together in the best way yet. Maybe it will be at some point, but. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a Porsche guy. So I say it's not <laughs> I a Porsche. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There, there's hey, nothing it's not like, an accurate either. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's nothing like a solid German made vehicle. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, I mean, I would, if, if it's a, if the coverage is the same or better, the premiums less, why the hell not? No, I agree. I agree. I, um, I don't drive uh, I'm enough like of an asshole anymore, so I can. Um, yeah. I would. I would probably opt into that if it was going to save me a few bucks. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm much less so now. Now that I have a, a one year old to protect when I'm driving, we're not. We're not going too far over the speed limit. 
That is probably for the better. Well, we want to yeah. uh, we want to start hearing from you guys. So if you have any use cases that you think that we missed, include them in the comments down below. Um, you know, is it, are, are we onto something here? Is, is this is going to be the future? What do or you think? any any suggestions for a different name than Soulbound tokens? Because I think that's the majority of the the flack that this post has been getting is just the name in general. So yeah. I don't know if we'll want to be calling these things SBTs or soulbound tokens for the next hundred years. So let's let's figure out a, a better name. Let's make sure we get it right the first time. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, a shorty, but a good. Thanks for uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks.